verse number one. Father, I pray that you give me the gift of teaching now and give me wisdom in the word of God. And our Father, I pray you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. Lord, uh, if anyone knows, you know how deceptive this age is. We need wisdom. We need guidance. We need the sweet Holy Spirit to lead us into the truth. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, in uh, Genesis chapter number 3, verse 1, the Bible said the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Uh, most of the, uh, art, the art that you see that depicts this shows a snake in a tree, and it is offering an apple to Eve, or Eve has the apple, and she's offering it to, uh, to Adam. And of course, uh, there's not one word of scripture, folks, that has anything to do with the apple, okay? You forget that right off the bat. Uh, and the snake, as far as the snake in the tree is concerned, that is a, that's an artist's depiction. That's just simply a fanciful uh, way of uh, trying to put across what they, want to, they think that this is talking about. But the Hebrew word translated serpent here is nakash. And that's important to understand because that word means a brilliant shining thing. Could very well have been something standing up on two legs, just like uh, appearing as a human being or as an angel with glory and beauty, unbelievable. Because the indication is that there was all kinds of striking color and uh, beauty about this creature. And so it deceived Eve. I doubt seriously if a snake uh, would have been able to do that. The curse upon this thing is that, that on its belly it shall crawl. And so you can see that the curse put it on its belly like a snake, but it wasn't originally like a snake. But the point of all of this is simply this. Satan can appear as an animal or in an animal fashion. Look over here in Revelation. Revelation. And uh, chapter number 12. Verse number 3, Revelation 12, 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. Now immediately the scholars' union begins to laugh and mock and make fun of the Bible. And so does the, uh, so does, uh, the uh, archaeologists and the rest of them. Uh, a dragon is a mythological creature, according to them. But the scripture speaks of it in the terms as if it is a real creature, a great red dragon. It's quite remarkable that in practically every culture on this earth, there is a uh, tradition, a history of men and women having to deal with dragons everywhere. They're all over the place. Uh, and all these cultures, all these disconnected cultures that have no way in the world of communicating with each other, you know, and handing, and handing the tradition from one culture to the next, separated by thousands of miles, all the way back into antiquity. How do you explain that? How do you explain the fact that all these different cultures, myriad cultures, have a tradition and they have pictures and so forth of dragons? Uh, I would believe the reason they do is because dragons are real. You see, I'm the kind of person that believes the Bible over so-called science or yeah. theology or anything else. I'm, I'm going to believe the Bible. You're going to have to prove to me that the Bible is not, is not uh, right or not correct, and I've yet to see it done. So a dragon is a creature that, uh, that, is, uh, that is wicked. Uh, that is uh, Usually there's a hero in the culture, like, for example, uh, in uh, Great Britain. I've showed you the red cross like this. That's the cross of St. George, and St. George is the British hero who slew the dragon. And that becomes part of the Union Jack, which makes up the British flag. Uh, he slew the dragon. So a dragon in the Bible, here in Revelation chapter number 12, represents Satan. Now, is this a symbolical thing, or is it, or is it real? Well, I take it for being real. <coughs> and the reason I do is because of the chronology of it. Where is it located? It's located right before Satan is cast out of the heavens. And he's cast out of the heavens by the hand of Michael, the only archangel in the Bible. 
So now we have a serpent over there in Genesis 3. We have a dragon here in Revelation 12. And if you remember over there in the book of Exodus, chapter number 4 and verse number 3, when Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, what did uh, Pharaoh's magicians, what were they able to do? They produced a snake. They produced a snake. They produced by supernatural, paranormal, however you want to call it, means they produced a snake. And, of course, you know the story how that uh, Aaron's uh, rod that uh, turned into the snake ate theirs up and, uh, and destroyed them. But they were snakes nonetheless, real snakes. So you're, you're, looking at the, you're looking at something here that gets in borders and in, in what's uh, in, into this area of human and animal. Now, how many of you have, uh, have any idea what a chimera is? Oh, not a few of you do. A chimera is a mixture, depends on what culture you're dealing with. In some cases, like Babylonian, you may have a man, a bull, or a man, and a lion. You may have a mixture, but what it is, is a mixture of a human and an animal. Well, I want to tell you right now, they are working in DNA with DNA uh, uh, research. They are taking human DNA and they are putting it into animals, uh, ostensibly to grow uh, parts for hearts, in other words, for good medical purposes, into, a, into an animal. Uh, you, Dr. Moreau, the island of Dr. Moreau is a reality today. Uh, he was a mad scientist that, uh, you know, that created monsters by mixing human beings and uh, animals. Well, this is happening. Turn over the book of Revelation chapter number 9. Revelation 9. And here in Revelation 9, you'll find... Uh, some uh, very weird creatures. Revelation chapter number 9, uh, verse number 2, he has the key to the bottomless pit, fifth angel. And uh, something comes up out of this pit and it begins to describe them. Verse 7, they are, they are like locusts. They are like unto horses prepared to battle and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. Faces as the faces of men, hair, hair of the women, teeth, or as it were, the teeth of lions. You've got a mixture here. This is a mixture. This is not a purebred anything. Look at Revelation chapter number 13. Verse number 2, Revelation 13, 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. Here again is another mixture. Now this is the Antichrist in Revelation 13, but he's introduced to us as a, as a mixture, a, as a composite animal. In Revelation chapter number 16, verse number 13, this is a clear indication, this is clear as it can be, Revelation 16, 13, I saw three unclean spirits. Now note the word like. The Bible doesn't say I saw three unclean spirits that were frogs. If the scripture had said that, that would be an entirely different take on it. It says I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. All right, now let's make first of all the connection. Spirits and animals can be one and the same. Number two. I showed you a picture of Lamb, the, uh, the, the spirit guide that uh, uh, Crawley over there in Great Britain, uh, Alistair Crawley, uh, come, uh, had as his spirit guide. It had this, it had this pear-shaped head or whatever you, top-shaped head with the big eyes, all right? This is the classic gray that you see so much of today. But it, I, I was on one website the other day and they took a frog and they laid it next to this <coughs> and it was amazing at how closely the frog resembled a gray or the big eyed thing bottom line is that here in revelation chapter number 16 this description of three unclear unclean spirits like frogs may very well have a, have a reference to a spirit being showing up like a like a like a gray like a like an alien 
And, uh, and, and, and the best way that he could define it would be like a frog. But so far what we've seen in the scripture is very clear in the Bible and there's much more in it than this. For example, you've got Leviathan over there in the book of Job and Behemoth in the book of Job. And you can deal with these. One says they're a crocodile. The other says there's a hippopotamus. If you read the, uh, what the scholars have to say about this and the Bible commentators. And I think both of them are as far from the truth as they possibly can be. Leviathan and Behemoth. Behemoth is another composite animal. And uh, Leviathan is, uh, is, uh, is, is literally the devil because he has teeth of iron. But it's, a, it's an animalistic thing connected with Satan and connected with spirit beings. This is important because we're coming down to a time in this country, in the time in chronology, a time in Bible prophecy, when, uh, when it seems like the gates are beginning to open. It seems like now the spirit is withdrawing and he's allowing more to be seen and more to come out than had been, uh, that, that has been up until this point. He that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Do you remember what I told you about Admiral Richard Byrd? Now, I had great respect for Admiral Byrd. I think he's very, a very honorable man, served his country. He was, a, he was an explorer. And I told you about Operation High Jump. Remember that, 1947? They sent this uh, task force down to Antarctica. And along with them, they had uh, Admiral uh, Chester Nimitz, who's the father of the nuclear navy. He's the man who was responsible for nuclear submarines. The trident that's out there under the water right now with enough nuclear power to blow uh, most nations off the face of the earth is a direct product of Admiral Nimitz. And uh, he was a great war hero of World War II. And uh, these are very honorable, sane men. They're not mad scientists from a laboratory somewhere. But I also told you how that, doc that, uh, that Admiral Richard Byrd in his diary and I told you before how about the diary of Admiral Byrd, whether or not it is legit or not, we do not know. We have, I have no way of, of tracing the provenance, the source of it, back to its beginning. I don't have any way to do that. I cannot prove to you whether it is, whether it is Admiral Byrd's diary or not. But what he says in there is remarkable. <laughs> because literally what Admiral Byrd puts in that diary is an abduction by an alien being like UFO abductions taking place today, which will blow your mind because he said he was flying over the North Pole and he went down into a, uh, into the, into a, into a crevice beneath the surface of the earth. There he met a spirit guide who was the master and communicated with him and all of this. That's a classic UFO abduction to communicate. They want, they want, to, they want to either find out something about you or they want to use you as a messenger to get a message back out. And so Admiral Byrd, uh, until his dying day, uh, was very, uh, very, very, very uh, adamant about the fact that uh, he saw, uh, he saw ships. He said this by, with his own, uh, with his own mouth. He he tr he tried to come back and warn the military establishment in America that that he saw ships. He said, if we ever fight another war. Uh, the enemy has ships that are able to fly from the South Pole to the North Pole in unbelievable speed, which, of course, is a reference to UFOs, which defy the laws of gravity and the laws of physics as we know them. These UFOs fly. They're real, but they're not real in the sense that a lot of people think they're real. A spirit is real, but a spirit is not flesh and blood. But a spirit is real. It's very real. Your flesh and blood's here today and gone tomorrow. Spirit's forever. Spirit's eternal. So uh, when, you, uh, when you look at this, you see that there has been definitely something going on, and I believe it has worked the desired result. Listen to this survey. This is quite a remarkable survey. Based on polls, over 60% of the population believes that there is likely alien life in outer space. Over 60%. Around 48% of the population believes that aliens from outer space may be visiting the earth in UFOs, and 12% claim to have seen a UFO. I was watching a video the other day, it's that DVD, uh, by Noah Hutchins. And when he was a young man, he said that he saw these three, these three uh, craft appear in the sky. And uh, he said they stayed there for some time. How many of you know who Noah Hutchins is? The, the uh, what is it, Southwest Radio Church? Uh, I think he's gone now. I think he's gone on to be with the Lord. But he was a he was man of God. He's, he's your brother. 
And uh, he, he, he personal uh, witness of what he had seen uh, in a UFO. It's not, he didn't, uh, he didn't try to say what he thought it, he couldn't break down what it was, but he's talking about what he saw. So uh, I've never seen a UFO, uh, no personal, no personal uh, uh, witness on my part uh, as to a UFO. I have seen lights in the skies at night that I couldn't explain, but I don't just jump up and say it's a UFO, you know. Uh, if, if I tell you that I've seen a UFO, I've seen something up there that I know is not of this earth and I know it's different and then I'm going to tell you if I've seen something like that. Uh, I have had people in the church tell me they have seen things and a lot of, most of the people, here's the fact, this is a fact. Most people, if they have seen something like a UFO, uh, are, are a little reluctant to say anything about it for the simple reason they don't want to be labeled as a nutball. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because there's still a lot of people out there, and I hope you're not one, but there's a lot of people out there that think this whole UFO thing is just a bunch of hyped up nothing, and that people who see UFOs are, are uh, fantasizing that they don't exist. Folks, they do exist. Millions of people have seen UFOs. There is a vast number of them, no doubt, that are hoaxes, no question about that. But we're not dealing with a hoax today, we're talking about reality. And I believe the UFO is going to be the vehicle that Satan uses to bring deception down on this earth. And I believe he's already opening the doors to do it. And it behooves us to study it and see what's going on with UFO. Now remember, I have to say it over and over and over and over and over again. I do not believe that aliens are coming from outer space down to this earth. I believe UFOs are demonic, Amen. but I believe they're real. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I worked down at uh, Florida back in the 70s, and I talked to uh, Colonel Naylor, who was a famous uh, uh, Air, Force, uh, Air Force pilot. And uh, he told me stories about what he saw. Right. Yes. And uh, we talked a little bit about it, but I, you live down in Florida, you see things. Yes, you do. Florida is one of the hot spots. I saw things that, that can't be explained at all. Yeah. Uh, you got the Kennedy Space Center down there. I'm sure that that, uh, that, that, draws, in, uh, that draws in some curiosity. Uh, a 1991 Roper poll estimated that four million people, this is 91, 1991, four million people in the U.S. may have had an alien abduction experience. That's a lot of people. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a totally separate study, and there's a lot of material available for it, but I'm giving you this morning's a much broader spectrum than simply dealing with abductions. I just wanted to put that in context to let you know that my personal belief is that Admiral Byrd came in contact when he saw these UFOs down there around the, around the Antarctica, and they did see them. These ships were down there, they saw them, that he, was, uh, that he came in contact and he somehow or another was, was brought into a spiritual abduction, and I believe that that's the source of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of Admiral Byrd's diary, the source of the, of the uh, information in that diary. Uh, it came from that abduction. That's the only thing that explains it. Uh, I do not believe that there's anywhere on this earth that you can fly a craft down to the center of the earth. I'd like to find that, wouldn't you? I mean, that would be quite a remarkable thing. On the other hand, I've, as I've told you before, I am not convinced exactly what's going on in the center of this earth. I know what science tells you. They say that the heart of the earth is a molten uh, lake, you know, uh, inhabitable and so forth. But we know the Bible says plainly that the heart of the earth was where hell was located. But hell was not, it's Hades or Sheol, and it's not like the concept people have. One side of it was, the, was paradise, and the other side, which was Abraham's bosom, and the other side was hell. But where was that? That was in the heart of the earth. And the Bible says in Ephesians, plainly led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. He brought them out of the heart of the earth. And uh, in the book of Jonah, when Jonah said, uh, the, the bars and gates of hell encompassed me. And uh, somebody said, well, he's speaking figuratively of being taken into the, into the belly of the whale. Well, Jonah's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the Lord Jesus Christ says, as Jonah was in the heart, of, was in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be where? In the heart of the earth. And that's not symbolical. That's literally where he went, to the heart of the earth. And then he arose on the third day from the dead. Now, as I started this thing this morning, talking to you about the connection between animal and human, and that's a big deal because that leads off into a lot of stuff. Uh, it's amazing at all the information out there and what all is happening. But um, how many of you are uh, how many of you are aware that uh, crop circles have been popping up all over the world? Some of these crop circles are without question hoaxes. They're crudely made, and it's been proven that somebody got a, a, a stomped around out there and stomped down some uh, wheat or whatever it was and, and made their crop circles. But that does not explain some of them. Some of them are the most intricate, beautiful, geometric patterns that you've ever laid your eyes on. And they defy scientific analysis. There is no way that they have been able to come to a conclusion on how they were made. Crop circles. But here's the thing about crop circles. Crop circles, Bigfoot, and cattle mutilations. What have they got in common? What does a crop circle, Bigfoot, and a cattle mutilation have in common? How many's heard of cattle mutilations? There's been a lot of documentaries on television. You got two sides. One side says that the, what happens to these animals out in the field is simply natural, and the natural predators do what they do to the animals. Blah blah blah. Then you got the other side that says, "Ain't no way that what happened to these cattle out here, and the fact that there's not no there's no blood, and there's no blood around them, and the and the incisions are so perfect, so clear." And I've I've watched documentaries where they tried to reproduce the incisions. Doctors did and could not. And uh, the, uh, so you've got another side out there that says, well, there's something going on with animal mutilations that defies sense. Then you have Bigfoot. Somebody said, I don't believe in Bigfoot. Well, tell that to the tens of thousands of people who will swear to you on a Bible, look you in the eye and tell you, I saw Bigfoot. See, don't tell me there is no Bigfoot. And so many skeptics in the country and around the world who at one time said, Bigfoot's not real, that's a bunch of junk, then they see him. And from that day on, they have been converted completely. They change. And then the crop circles. So what do crop circles, Bigfoot, and cattle mutilations, or horse mutilations, animal mutilations, what do they got in common? There's a remarkable thing. Let me read this testimony to you, and I'll give you a clue. This is about Bigfoot. In Wisconsin, 11 witnesses in two cars clearly saw a UFO in a field. All right, now we've got 11 witnesses in a car. Clearly saw a UFO in a field. When it shot into the air, they all saw a giant ape-like creature retreating into the nearby woods. A soul. <laughs> we've got a UFO and we've got Bigfoot. Summer of, 18, uh, summer of 1981, a family in Ohio discovered a 20 inch long footprint in their woods. Afterwards, they began having a series, now watch this, a series of encounters with Bigfoot involving numerous witnesses. UFO sightings were included in this experience. Isn't that amazing? Never thought much about Bigfoot and UFO, the connection. Then beginning 1985, an Oregon family experienced ongoing communication sightings with a family of Sasquatch, including UFO encounters, Bigfoot and UFOs. For many, either one standing alone can be hard to believe, but linking them together is almost impossible to fathom. Now, I've always believed there's something going on with Bigfoot. I've never seen one. They have been reported right here. I didn't, don't scare anybody. <laughs> In East Tennessee, right here. <laughs> All you got to do is just do a little Google search on it, and you'll find that Bigfoot's here. Now, what's going on, preacher? All right. 
Caiaphas. Just hold your place here and go to cattle mutilations. This is from Argentina. Now, I'm going to show you how current this is. 9-10-2015. This is pretty, pretty current. September the 10th, 2015. This is from Argentina. The, the Journal of Hispanic UFOlogy. I'm going to zoom down to this point. He stated that mutilations have particular characteristics that allow them to be determined as UFOs. They drill a hole in, uh, on the animals, draw all of their blood, and that's why they say it's the chupacabra. But the fact is not a single trace is left. For a winged creature to be able to absorb so many animals, it would have to be an enormous creature. No one has seen that. It's all stories. This man, Mario Zane Pinto, has an enormous amount of information on UFOs, and he believes, he believes, against the government party line, this man believes that UFOs, the occupants of UFOs, are involved in cattle mutilations. I watched a documentary on the History Channel, or someone, somewhere, to refresh my memory about some things that I had seen years ago. And this was about two or three days ago. And lo and behold, they were talking about these cattle that they find in the field. Uh, prized bull, they find him in the field. Then there's this round circular area, not far from it, where something with enormous heat has, Im has, has Im made an impression in the surface of the earth, like a UFO had been there, connected with these animal mutilations. Many times, they'll take that animal, they'll check it out, and it has a high radiation content in its body. They'll bury that animal in the ground, and showed one man, rancher in particular up in Canada, you go back three or four years later, five years later, and no grass will grow on top of that. No animal will touch that carcass. They won't come up and eat on it because the, the, you know, the scavengers and the predators, when they find a dead animal like that in the field, normally they'd come up and they'd consume it, but they won't touch it because there's something in the flesh of that animal. It's connected with UFOs, crop circles, same thing. You have these disc-like areas around where you find the crop circle. And here's another thing. When you get into crop circles, cattle mutilation, and Bigfoot, the people that are, uh, that are exposed to this, so many of them begin to have these supernatural paranormal experiences where they begin to see demons, they have these, they have these, uh, they have, where their minds start, they start, some people have lost their mind. They have all of this spiritual, spiritual, uh, it seems like attacks from being associated with these things. Begins to make sense, doesn't it? Now let me say something to you as it relates to theology. As I've said to you many times before, the Bible is our absolute guide when it comes to this. The Bible, the Word of God. I was preached to and taught all my Christian life that on the spirit world, people just take it for granted that because it's an angel or because it's a fallen angel or because it's a demon or because it's a spirit being that it has this great knowledge of God. Find that in the Bible. The only way you'll ever know, you, angels, demons, whatever, will ever know anything about God is as he reveals himself. Canst thou by searching find out God? No. And as I've said to you before, man is the only creature that's made in the image of God, which means that God has a unique, special purpose for mankind. And that one day we will be allowed to see the unseeable. As the apostle says, he dwells in the light which no man can see, which no man hath seen, no man can approach. That's the Almighty. He does not dwell in creation. He, dwelled, he has been forever before creation. There's not a man, unless he's the most arrogant thing on the face of this earth, that would even dare tell you he knows the essence of God. Do you? I wouldn't venture into that. I wouldn't touch that at all. 
I understand the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I understand all that. But would you tell me you understand the essence of God? He's an eternal being. He's an almighty being. He's pure light. He's holy. That's God. Now, here's the reason I'm saying all that. Everything that exists has been created. Everything that exists is not living. But we're living, and so are animals living. And so are all of this stuff that, uh, like angels and, and, uh, and other creatures, we're living. Don't you think it's quite remarkable that these spirit beings want blood? Don't you think it's quite remarkable that they're taking a living creature and they're trying to learn as much as they possibly can about that living creature? Listen, Anna, angels did not create you. Demons did not create you. When Satan came to the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and said, if thou be the Son of God, he was genuine in that question. He didn't know. He didn't know. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, Hebrews chapter number 1 says plainly, let all the angels of God worship him. I've read 25 or 30 commentaries, and most of them don't have a clue. Most of them are saying, well, that has to do with something up in the, in the, in the millennial reign when the angels come around and they were No, it has nothing to do with that. Hebrews chapter number 1 is talking about the incarnation. It's talking about Christ coming into this world. It's talking about God becoming a man who was a baby in a manger, the almighty eternal being, and that little baby in that manger. God says, now you worship that baby right there in that manger. Some of the angels did and some of them didn't. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is it that Satan... Don't you? How many think Satan's smart? How many think he's smarter than you? You ever ask yourself the question, why is it that Satan thinks that he is, is so arrogant to think that he can tear God down and destroy him and, and build his own kingdom? In Isaiah, he said, I will be like the Most High. Didn't he? He'd never seen the Most High. He'd seen a manifestation of the Most High. He'd never seen him. Here's what I firmly believe. I firmly believe that if a creature, I don't care what that creature is, ever laid his eyes on that pure, holy essence of Almighty God, I don't care who it is, even Michael, there's no way in his soul he could say, I could be like that. No way. For that eternal being is so far above his creation and creatures like me and you that it is, it is a gulf that is, that, that is unbelievable. It's unsurpassable. We pull God down to our level because we can understand him on our level. That's what men do. And they recreate him in their own image. That's what they do. And they drag him down and they make him one of us. And he's not one of us. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, I was listening to a man a couple of days ago and he said this about Christ. He said, why, well, sure he had children. Why, well, surely he was married to, he had Mary Magdalene. Or he would not have been complete. And this was a reverend. He's never read the scripture that says, and he likewise took part of the same. Referring to the incarnation. That's a big deal. He was a man, but he wasn't a man like you. You're fallen. He wasn't fallen. You're full of decay. He had no decay. He did not re uh, re procreate and recreate by the same method you do. In the book of Psalms, it talks about him having children, but not like you have them. In Psalms, it talks about the children that God hath given me. There's a difference there. So this reverend comes along and says, no, he had to be like us. He had to have children. Or he would not have been a complete man. That's the term he used. I thought to myself, what a blasphemer. <laughs> of course, he's the one that subscribes to the, uh, what's that fellow's name? Made all that money on that, uh, the uh, 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 brand, uh, Brown, Dan Brown, uh, on that thing about the, uh, the Moravingian uh, bloodline, the, the kings of Europe, the kings of uh, France, and, and Christ and, and Mary, had, uh, Mary Magdalene had children, and their children became the royal bloodline of Western Europe, and people have bought that stuff up. Americans are ignorant, boy. They run up and buy that, and they think, boy, this is a different take. This has got to be right. 
And they buy it and believe that junk, which is just pure garbage. And by the way, Dan Brown wasn't original with anything. <laughs> he was original in making millions. <laughs> I'll tell you that, no question about it. Now here's why I said all that. Could it be that this spirit world is creating a monster to come on the face of the earth and God withholds until he opens the door and allows that thing to appear and what they have in mind is going to be a big surprise and they've been, they've been drawing from the creation, from humanity, from animals, from every, every possible way so that they can come up with something that will closely resemble you but it won't be you. It'll be something entirely different. Could it be? That's a scenario. That's a possibility. I would subscribe to that before I would a lot of this other stuff that I've heard. Yes, sir. So they're taking they're taking the blood from a from a cow the plasma, taking the plasma, and uh, and they're and they're and using it to treat our our troops with that on the field. Exactly. All right. So there's a lot of between the two. Yes, sir. Biologically, I'm sure there's a lot of similarities between a human being and, and and an animal. Biologically, your body, they've got flesh, you've got flesh, they've got blood, you've got blood, but the difference is that man's made in the image of God. There is a difference. There is a, there is a line that cannot be crossed. This is why it says in the book of Genesis, everything after its own kind, when it had its after its own kind. You have variations in the kind. All he had to do is take one set of dogs on board that ark, and from those dogs came wolves and all these other, you know, many, many, many varied forms of dogs that have been bred down through the centuries. But all he needed was one pair, and same with everything else. Uh, he, you believe God knows before man ever does it what, God, what man's going to do? <laughs> well, you know, we say he knows the end in the beginning. He really does know the end in the beginning. And uh, when he creates a thing, he creates it with all that potential and with that fore, foreknowledge. I marvel sometimes when I think about the fact that uh, the only thing you're going to know about God is what he reveals of himself. When you got saved, he revealed himself as the Savior. How many know what I'm talking about? Uh, you needed a Savior. You needed a Savior. You were lost and going to hell, and you needed a Savior. And then the Lord Jesus became so sweet and so precious to you. That was a revelation. That was a revelation. That came from God. Uh, you can't find him. You won't, you'll never find Christ. It came from God. And so it is with this. Now, here's the thing. It makes no difference what Satan and his cohorts are able to do. Uh, if you remember now, the book of Exodus is a key to a lot of this because Aaron and Moses would do one thing and the magicians would do the, do, would do, do the same thing. Uh, what are their names over there? What is it? Uh, Jan Janus and Jambres, yeah. It mentions their name in the New Testament. They were able to do it. So don't think lightly on that, but remember this. God Almighty is still in control. Yes, he is. Stick in the book. Stick in the book. All right, and I've run out of time. We've got a couple of minutes left, and then we'll let you go. Anybody have a question before we leave? I hope this isn't... Uh, <laughs> I, I, hope you, I hope you don't come in here and think, is this a church? <laughs> All right, here's bottom line. If you don't hear it in here, where are you going to hear it? <laughs> they use a valve from a pig. The pig skin, they say, is probably about the closest to, to human skin. I've heard that. You know, I'm no scientist, no doctor. I couldn't. Uh, all I know is what I've heard, but that's what they say. So, the, you know, from a pig's heart, a valve, and use it to, to mend a human heart with. I've heard that. Yeah. Yes, sir.
That's right. And Lucifer was the fifth beast or the fifth cherub. Cherub. But they're also referred to as the beast. Mm -hmm. The Greek word is zoe. In Revelation, uh, the four beasts, four living creatures are zoe. And the zoe is where we get our English word zoo. Comes straight from Greek. And it simply means a living thing. You go to the zoo not to look at concrete. You go to the zoo to look at living things. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll meet again next Sunday morning. Get back in this. Brother, will you dismiss us, please?